rep represented as being, uh, to take on uh, Egyptian ways. In the 1980s in Saqqara near Cairo, archaeologists found the tomb of a former prime minister of ancient Egypt called Appa El. His name, Appa El, is highly significant. The word El was the Canaanite term for God. The name Upper El, of course, is not an Egyptian name, it's a Semitic name. And this man was the vizier, he was the prime minister of, of Lower Egypt, Northern Egypt, during the days of Pharaoh Akhenaten. So here we have a Semite who achieved a very high position in the administration under Pharaoh Akhenaten. Clearly, pharaohs did occasionally appoint Semite prime ministers. But all the evidence of this is from the New Kingdom, some 300 years after Joseph's death. There's no proof that it ever happened in the Middle Kingdom, Joseph's time. But some historians are chasing other leads. Joseph was appointed prime minister on the strength of his predictions of famine. Evidence of Middle Kingdom famines and measures to deal with them would support the biblical account. A newly discovered stela, a stone tablet, does indeed recount a spate of Middle Kingdom famines. This is an interesting stela. We see the governor and in front of him uh, statements of various events of his life. One of them is a mention of a famine, and it indicates to us that uh, famines were quite frequent. The mention of famines is not haphazard. Uh, it's mentioned in certain episodes, and almost invariably we can uh, correlate those famines with global climatic changes. Confirmation of these Middle Kingdom famines has recently been found to the south of Egypt, in snow and ice at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. Lonnie Thompson and his team of geologists climb from the jungle to beyond the snow line to drill for ice cores. And these ice cores can tell us about Egypt's climate history. Kilimanjaro is, let's say it's the only site that you can get an ice core record that would record events in this part of the world. But it's also very relevant to the history of Egypt because the headwaters of the Nile depend on rain and the accumulation on this ice field on Kilimanjaro depends on snow, all coming from the same events. So they are very closely linked and you should see a record of that in these ice cores. In the lab, the scientists examine the ice core for the presence and quantity of dust. Dust is a fingerprint of major climate change because its presence suggests an ancient catastrophe. A volcanic eruption or even a meteor strike. Such an event would throw massive quantities of dust into the atmosphere, disrupting weather patterns and rainfall, causing drought, and ultimately famine. Well, th these are sections of the Kilimanjaro ice core. Uh, they are, they're from about uh, 40 meters below the surface. And this is the older piece that we see here. And we see this very distinct dust event. This represents 4,200 years ago. It's a 300 year drought in the Egyptian history. This is not the famine Joseph predicted but the cataclysmic famine that led to the cannibalism discussed in Ankitifi's tomb 500 years before Joseph's time. By contrast, the evidence for Joseph's famine should appear higher up the core as a smaller scatter of dust particles. As you come up in the core, you can see that uh, this very clean, clean core up until very top here, you can see these very small uh, particles, dust clumps of this event about 3,600 years ago. The clusters of dust correspond with the eruption in 1644 BC of the Thera volcano in the Aegean Sea, just 500 miles north of Egypt. 
Now, the Bible, of course, is quite specific that the famine lasts seven years. This seven-year cycle also rings true. It fits with the climate phenomenon known as El Nino, which has often caused famine, always in seven-year cycles. We have one of these events that occurred between 1790 and 1797. Very large drought uh, through India uh, in 1792. In north central India, 600,000 people starved to death. And at the same time that you have the drought in India, you have very low water levels in the Nile River. And it lasted for seven years. The Bible also claims that as vizier, Joseph took measures to deal with the famine. Since famine is often caused by drought, one important task would have been to ensure that water continued to reach agricultural areas. The breadbasket for much of Egypt now and in the past is the fertile land around Lake Karun to the west of the country. Here we are in the middle of Lake Karum in the Fayum Depression. On the east side of the lake, you have the verdant agriculture, palm trees, and all sorts of other greenery. On the other hand, to the west, you have a vast, empty stretch of desert. So that you can take a look at this lake as the dividing point between agriculture and life, and desert and death. In very ancient times, the lake was fed by water from a branch of the Nile. But the old kingdom drought that devastated Egypt caused this branch to dry up, turning the lake to dust. So to avert another crippling famine, a Middle Kingdom official came up with an ingenious plan to keep the link between the lake and the Nile permanently open. The Egyptian government decided to dredge one of these branches and make it deeper and keep it free from silt and essentially make it a functioning canal. The project was so successful that the canal is still in use today. That work project must have taken thousands of men. We don't know how many people, we don't know how many hours, days, weeks, months, years but it kept this branch of the Nile clear, and it enabled this area, the area around Fayum, to maintain its fertility. This construction project would have been essential in stopping future famines. Best estimates indicate that it was built between 1850 and 1650 BC. That's the right time for Joseph's era. Unfortunately, there's no record of who built the canal. But for thousands of years, it has only been known by one name. In Arabic, it's the Bawa Yusuf, which translated into English is the waterway of Joseph. During a famine, Joseph would have made other key decisions to protect Egypt and save his pharaoh's skin. A man who steers his people and his king through great adversity might expect a big reward. The Bible claims that Joseph asks Pharaoh if his family can settle in Egypt. Pharaoh allows Joseph and his brothers to live in a city called P. Ramesses in the Nile Delta in the north. But archaeologists surveying the area could find no trace of the city. Then one day in the 1970s, a farmer found the first remarkable clue, the remains of a colossal statue. Archaeologists are convinced this was the site of the city mentioned in the Bible.
Ramses the Great, Ramses the Second, who is one of the most important kings of the New Kingdom. This is the area of Piramesse, his capital. It was a huge city in this time. We have here the statue and we know we have a temple over there and several other temples and uh, villas. The find raised hopes that this was where Joseph had settled and was reunited with his brothers. And he was, and a hook he was. But these hopes were dashed when archaeologists established that P. Ramesses was built 300 years after Joseph's time. Worse still, there was no sign of a Semitic presence at all. But inscriptions were then discovered, suggesting that P. Ramesses was built on top of an older city called Avaris. If they could find it, then maybe they could find Joseph. We know from ancient sources that Avaris must be located in the south of Piramesse, of the former capital of Ramses. So uh, the, the excavators who were searching for Avaris, they started in the south and they finally discovered it and could attach the name Avaris to the, to the things we were excavating. Now, excavations are gradually revealing the secrets of a virus. It was built 300 years before P. Ramesses, just when Joseph was thought to have lived, and its ruins reveal tantalizing clues to a Semitic presence. Although most of the buildings were Egyptian in style, one area was distinctly Canaanite. But the most compelling evidence of a Semitic presence came from inside the houses. These bodies were found buried in sideways postures, a typically Canaanite tradition. And objects found inside the burial pits left archaeologists in no doubt. We have a lot of uh, Canaanite uh, shapes, like the jugs here, combined with Egyptian shapes, like the small vessel here. We find sometimes weapons attached to the tombs, like this sword. It's made of bronze. And then with the same tomb comes a belt in very fragile condition, which the male burial had around his hip. So we have always the mixture of both cultures. These finds are consistent with the Bible's claim that Semites settled in the Nile Delta, but only poor Semites, perhaps slaves. None of it indicated that someone of Joseph's status, a high-ranking pharaonic official of Semitic origin, had lived there. But further finds at Avaris suggest that archaeologists are closing in on that elusive evidence. The excavations have since been returned to agricultural use, but not before extensive plans and photographic records were made. David Roll, a specialist in biblical and ancient history, examined, then reconstructed part of the site. In this field, they found a very special monument. This is what's left of it. It's actually the floor of a palace. It's not a huge palace, it's not a royal palace, but it's a very, very high quality villa of some high official. Reconstructed, you can see how complex it is. There are various elements to it built at different times. The main part here, the audience chamber and main bedroom, is fronted by a, a 12 column portico. Then later on was added this twin suite, if you like, of rooms with another portico in front, which enclosed then this courtyard. This small palace looked like the home of a high-ranking official. But it was a 